And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from or what time you might be viewing this recording later. We're excited you could be here. Today's presentation is right for anyone who's ever wondered, what are those admission committees thinking? What do they even do with all of those documents that they asked me for? Do they even read my statement of purpose? Or I earned my undergraduate degree 20 years ago. Does my experience matter? Or are they just looking at my GPA? This presentation is meant to go really beyond the fielding application requirements and give you insight into graduate admissions considerations that will be useful for you no matter where you decide to apply. We want to get started with a few housekeeping items. Um, today's presentation is being recorded for those who are unable to attend live. So uh, in order to help mitigate distractions and make sure we have a pleasant experience for everyone, we encourage you to keep your microphone on mute and turn off your video during the presentation. Please do feel free to type your questions into the chat as we go along. We will have time at the end for a Q&A. And at that time, you're welcome to uh, take, you know, come off of mute and ask your questions um, and, uh, and turn on your video if you want to engage. Uh, but throughout the presentation, we don't want you to forget those questions. So if you'd like to, uh, you can go ahead and, and put them in the chat as you go along. This is part two of our virtual open house series. For those of you who may have been able to join us last week, we had part one, which was all about fielding. We talked about the history of fielding, the student experience and alumni support. If you missed it and you'd like to check it out, you can view the recording on the open house page of our website. But today we are going to be talking about the fun topic of application tips. And if you've ever attended application tips webinars in the past, you might notice a little bit different framework for our presentation today. We aren't just walking through the steps of the application, although we will of course do that in the end, but our goal here is really to empower you to approach your application with confidence. So today's presentation is going to give you insight into what might seem like a secretive process, but it really boils down to three main concepts that we're going to be discussing in future slides. This is going to be a very collaborative event. So I just wanted to share that with you before we introduce ourselves. And you might notice that one of these presenters or more <laughs> might be chiming in on the slide if we have something to add. My name is Erica Fichter. I am the Director of Recruitment and Admission at Fielding Graduate University. I've been in my role here for about two and a half years now, but I have nearly a decade of experience in graduate admissions and I've served on numerous admissions panels, both domestically and internationally. So I'm excited today to have the opportunity to share the insights I've gained over the last 10 years of my career. And hello, everybody. Great to see so many familiar names. My name is Caroline Wetterburn, and I'm the Senior Admissions Advisor for the programs within our School of Leadership Studies. I've been with Fielding for three years now and located in Santa Barbara, California, where we're headquartered. As an admissions advisor, I love hearing about what you're already doing, as well as your motivations and goals to bring about positive changes, whether that be in your organization, your community, or your school setting. So thank you all so much for being here today and allowing us to be part of your higher education journeys. Sorry, I was on mute there. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Brian Wallen, and I'm the admissions advisor for our clinical psychology programs and our postdoctoral programs here at Fielding. Um, it's so rewarding for me to be able to assist you all in, in getting to the places you'd like to go. It's so exciting and rewarding to be able to hear the excitement and passion in your voices as we're talking about what you'd like to achieve and what you're hoping to do in, in the programs that you're looking at. Now, I want to add a quick note here. If there's anyone here who is interested in our clinical psychology programs, I just want to highlight that today's presentation is geared towards our non-clinical programs. So much of the information presented in the first pre part of the presentation may not be directly applicable to you. Um, we do have an application workshop designated specifically for our clinical psychology programs, and that's scheduled for Saturday, July 10th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We'll share a link to register for that event in the chat box here in just a moment. 
Now we will be sharing some information about the layout of the application portal today as well, and that's applicable to, to all of the programs. So if you're here for clinical, definitely stay tuned for that part of the presentation as well. Thank you everyone for the opportunity to be here. I'm very happy to, uh, to hear from everyone today, and I'll pass it over to Ignacio. Hi everyone, I'm Ignacio Vargas, the admissions advisor that specializes in the media psychology programs and the infant and early childhood development program or IACD program for short. I'm excited to be here to present some ways to uplift your application into our programs later on in the presentation. But in the meantime, Erica will go over a bird's eye view of what this web webinar will be about and what you Thank you all, my illustrious panelists. Appreciate you being here today uh, and, and supporting this presentation with me. Quick review of our agenda. We're gonna start out by talking high level about the committee considerations of what they're thinking about while they're evaluating your application. We're going to review the different admissions documents and talk about some best practices as you approach each aspect of the application. Brian is going to walk us through the application portal, as he mentioned, and we're going to talk about your next steps with Caroline, and then, of course, have the time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, so demystifying the admissions process. Um, it seems like a, a, a nebulous thing, but really the first thing you need to know, believe it or not, the committee has your best interest at heart. They want to ensure you're set up for success. I do want to note that, as Brian mentioned earlier, today's presentation is really most relevant for very holistic approaches to admissions, uh, meaning that all of your materials are weighted together before making a final decision. Um, so that relates to many graduate programs around the, around the world. Um, however, we certainly encourage you to, to speak with the, the admissions team at the school you're considering and the programs you're considering, you know, to make sure what exactly they might be looking for um, in, in making sure that you're, you're set up for success. Okay, so what is the committee thinking? As I mentioned, it may seem very nebulous, but there, there really boils down to three primary considerations. Is this, with, the, with your success in mind, as they review your admissions package, they're asking themselves, is this the right program for what they want to accomplish? Are we the right place? Is there a mutual fit here? And is this the right time for you to pursue this academic journey? And the next few slides, we're gonna go more in depth about what each of these mean after a, brief, after a brief review, sorry, of the programs that we offer. Within our School of Psychology, we offer um, an APA accredited PhD in clinical psychology, doctoral masters and certificate programs in the rapidly advancing and highly relevant field of media psychology. These programs do articulate into one another. We have a PhD in infant early childhood development or IECD as Ignacio mentioned, uh, with an with emphasis in mental health and developmental disorders. And that is the only program of its kind in the world. We have a one year post baccalaureate certificate that prepares students to be competitive applicants to clinical psychology PhD programs, a postdoctoral re-specialization in clinical psychology, and a two-year neuropsychology specialization training program. Within our School of Leadership Studies, we offer doctoral degrees in education, human development, and organizational development and change, a degree completion program for those with recent doctoral credits, a newly redesigned one-year virtual master's in organization development and leadership, and a certificate in evidence-based coaching, which is an accredited coach training program in accordance with the ICF or International Coach Center. Now that we've talked a little bit about the programs and about program, place, and time, uh, we want to talk about, you know, what, what do you want to do? So the, the piece about wondering if it's the right program. Can this program actually help you to do what you want to do? The last thing we want to do is admit you into a program that isn't going to meet your expectations or bring you closer to realizing your goals. So how do we determine this and what materials send this message? The very first thing is your statement of purpose or a personal statement or other essay. It may be titled any number of things depending on how the university approaches it. We're gonna dive deeper into some best practices for approaching the personal statement and these other items in future slides. But for now, we just wanna talk a little bit about 
um, how giving you a little bit of insight into how the committee actually uses these materials. Another place the committee might look for this information is in your letters of recommendation, which is why it's important to prepare your references, as we'll talk about later on. And depending on your university, your resume may also be considered in determining your, your goals or if this is the right program, because it can tell how your experience has shaped your future goals. Finally, always remember, faculty and staff engagement may be considered. How have you expressed your goals in your interactions with the admission staff or with the faculty? And before we go on to the next slide, I do wanna point out, it's perfectly fine if you don't know exactly what you want to do. It's not that we're expecting you to say, I want to go to do company X or work in company Y or start this particular company. You know, graduate school is a very transformational experience. So even if you are one of the people that does know exactly what you wanna do, we still encourage you to remain open to new experiences and opportunities based on the people you, need, you meet and the new knowledge that you gain in the program. The next part is, is this the right place? What matters to you? What are you looking for in your school culture and community? This is really all about fit. That can also mean something as simple as modality. If you state in your personal statement that you're looking for a traditional experience, then a distributed learning environment like the one at Fielding may not be the right place for you. This can also include how you express or what types of connections you're hoping to make, both with faculty and fellow classmates during your journey as it's a big part of your educational experience. You're gonna see similar documents here that are gonna provide committee with insight about that and about whether or not the, right, the school that you're looking for is the right place. The last thing is, is this the right time? Are you ready to be successful? Is there sufficient evidence that you have the academic skills and the time available to be successful in the program? Your preparation, your communication with faculty and staff, and your personal statements are all items that really help the committee understand that you're ready to devote the necessary time to your studies. Now that you have a little bit of a framework into how the committee looks at the different aspects of your application and approaches that, we're gonna go deeper into each one of these and discuss best practices. I'm gonna provide a brief overview of why these documents might be requested, and then my other panelists will step in and provide some best practices. First off, resume or CV, depending on you know, how it's requested. It may say resume, it may say CV, it may say resume or CV. Why does the committee ask for this? It really is to get to know you in a professional manner, to get to know your background. What have you, what have you done over your career? Uh, what have you accomplished? Um, it, it helps us to understand a little bit more about um, what, what is interesting to you. And in context with your future goals, how has your experience helped to shape those future goals? It really helps you just start to become more of a three-dimensional candidate. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of reason why we request it. Now I'm going to turn it over to Ignacio and he's gonna talk about some best practices and a little bit of do's and don'ts when preparing a resume. Thank you, Erica, very good points. I wanna point out that most resumes in the United States are competency-based and they're aimed at showcasing your potential to succeed in a role. For programs requiring a resume, you will want to make sure to include relevant experience that highlight key strengths and experiences. This is where you'll want to contextualize your impact. One example would be saying something in your resume like, increase conversion rate of clients into buyers by 10% in the second quarter of 2019. By including the action, the measured effect of that action and the time period of that action, the committee is given a more full picture of your impact and success. Similarly, kind of switching over to the U.S. curriculum vitaes, these are more credential-based, providing a comprehensive and often lengthy listing and description of your education, certifications, research experience, and professional affiliations and memberships. You want to be able to include all of these different experiences in your curriculum vitae because you are given the room to do so, and also the ones that are relevant to the program you're pursuing. So for the programs requiring a CV, you want to make sure that you tailor these relevant experiences and highlight your research, influence, and impact in your academic professional career path towards this program. Um, the other thing too is that you don't want to get too focused on listing everything you've done. You just want to make sure you highlight the different experiences that can be beneficial and show the committee that you're capable of pursuing and completing a doctoral program. Don't use too much jargon as well. Even though you are in a specific industry, 
try to avoid doing so unless that program specifically um, looks into that. And then um, do not overlook the school specific requirements. A lot of information to fulfill your application, it is included in the application portal. So make sure to read the instructions carefully when submitting your application documents. Wonderful points, Ignacio. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to talk about transcripts. Um, most programs are going to ask for transcripts at the graduate level. They're going to be looking at either undergraduate transcripts or if you've attended any other graduate school, they're going to want to see those transcripts. And you know, a common theme throughout all of this is to get to know you. We use all of these different documents to get to know you in various capacities. This also gives us insight into your academic experience and, and your performance. How have you performed and how have you excelled in certain academic spaces or not? You know, it, and it can help us understand your readiness for graduate level work. The one thing to remember, this is the one thing you can't change. We know that nine times out of 10, it's not 100% of the case, but most of the time, we're not looking for you to go back and pursue an, a second undergraduate degree and you know, if, if, you, if your first one, you didn't get the GPA that you really wanted. That's where in a holistic type of review, um, committees are looking at things that you've done since graduation, or they may be looking at your statement of purpose, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides as to you know, what might've transpired you know, in your undergraduate degree, what has changed, you know, why that's not a concern moving forward and why, why you feel that you're still gonna be successful at the graduate level. So there's certainly things that you can do to overcome in most situations. And now I will let Ignacio and some of my other colleagues talk a little bit about best practices with your transcript. Thank you, Erica. Yeah, so another thing to consider when you are looking to order your transcripts is to be uh, realistic in regards to ordering your transcripts. Um, they're having cases of students having unexpected delays, wrong transcript orders, missing transcripts. So if you are looking to apply to our programs, order your transcripts as soon as possible for the program and check in on what is the best delivery method that your institution will use, whether it's by mail or email. Uh, that is something that to take in consideration because if your transcript is delayed and is not submitted by the deadline, then our committee will not be able to review your application since all documents need to be submitted by the deadline to be considered. Um, another thing too is just to um, not make excuses in regards to the um, aspect of the transcripts. Um, and wait to, waiting to order, kind of just being realistic, but going back to that point of being realistic in regards to ordering these transcripts and making sure they're on time. Um, and then do not overlook opportunities to showcase your academic strength. The transcripts are one aspect of the application, they're not everything. So in your statement of purpose, which we'll highlight a little bit later, you can also illustrate other ways you've been able to showcase your academic strength as well. Thank you, Ignacio. And I'll just add on another, another point about you know, excuses. Really, what we're, when, when you're thinking about if you were one of those with an undergraduate GPA that, you know, that isn't, isn't, isn't exactly the, what you would have hoped, um, you know, being realistic and, and, and uh, accountable in your statement of purpose and talking about what had transpired. And again, talking to, you know, if, it, if maybe there, there was something that had happened in your life, you know, maybe it was something that, um, that you were, you know, you, very young when you were in undergrad, you weren't really pursuing something you were passionate about. Um, you know, and maybe you were working full time, whatever it is, being realistic about what what transpired, you know, what you've learned since then, or or what has changed since then, or if you've gone on to do graduate level work since then and have really excelled and been able to show, you know, that you've you've got strong academic performance at the graduate level, or even courses as a non degree seeking student, um, just being being really being accountable into to what what happened and what you have learned and again just filling in the gaps so that the committee understands why it's not a concern moving forward and that you still um, have are a strong chance of being successful on the program and erica i just wanted to highlight due to a, a question in the chat um, the gpa minimum requirement for our doctoral programs is a 3.0 and then for our certificate and master's programs, it's typically a 2.5. So just for reference, those are the minimum requirements. Um, if you did want to explain anything lower than that, that's what we're referencing. You can use the statement of purpose as an opportunity to explain some of the reasons behind a, a GPA lower than the minimum requirement. Yes, thank you for saying that, because even though we do have the minimum requirements, we, we will still review all completed applications. 
uh, for consideration. And that's where we use those other materials. And when I talk about the holistic review, there may be other things that showcase that you still have a strong um, ability to be successful in the program and that can help to, to outweigh your GPA. So even though we have that minimum GPA, uh, we, we do still review all, all completed applications uh, regardless of GPA. So just wanna make sure you're aware of that. All right, and now Caroline, you can talk to us about our international transcript. Thank you. Now, if your degree was earned outside of the US, it will need to undergo an international transcript evaluation. This is to ensure that we establish equivalency with a regionally accredited US degree. And we accept evaluations from a number of agencies. A few of them are listed on the slide here, but you may use any current members of the National Association of Credential Evaluation Services. And there's a link on our website as well to that. Now, you'll need to request an evaluation that lists each of your classes with grades and a cumulative GPA. That is generally called a course by course evaluation. When you go to order them on their website, they'll have different types of evaluations that you can request. Be sure to order the course by course evaluation. Now you'll provide an official transcript to the evaluation agency according to their process, and then request that they send the evaluation directly to fielding once it's completed. Now keep in mind the evaluation can take three weeks or more so as Ignacio highlighted, be sure to start that process early so it's received by the application deadline for the term that you are applying. And if you have any questions about your prior degrees, what will be needed for your particular application, please don't hesitate to contact us by phone or email. We'll, we'll be happy to provide clarification and further instructions for you. Perfect, thank you so much for that, Caroline. All right, now we're moving into statement of purpose or personal statement or whatever type of statement. Like I said before, it could be called something different depending on the university. Um, but it, and sometimes there will actually be specific prompts, specific questions that they might be asking you to, to reference when you're submitting a statement of purpose. This is one of the most important aspects of your application. And I don't know that everyone usually like really un understands this, um, because although I keep talking about we use these items to get to know you, this is the most important, the most important document that allows us to get to know you. This is where we start to understand what are your goals? Where have you, you know, your, your resume tells us where you've been. Your statement of purpose tells us, you know, what, what are you wanting to accomplish? Where are you hoping to go? What are you looking for in a program? What's important to you? What do you know about our school? Why do you want to attend our school? Why do you want to do this program? Um, that, that's where a lot of the program place and times really comes into play and where we, we get that, that real strong picture of who you are. That's your, your introduction to the committee. So it is a very important piece. And there are lots of do's and don'ts and I'm sure that my colleagues can, can come in and, uh, and add some additional, um, additional information here. But one of the things I really like to say is be authentic in this. You know, speak from your authentic voice. Don't Google how to write a grad school essay. And the reason I say that is because we truly do read each and every one of these. And when you're really speaking from, from, your, from your heart and really speaking in your authentic voice, that's how we really see you as a person. If it reads like you Googled how to write a grad school essay, nothing jumps off the page. We finish reading it and we're like, I still have no idea who this person is or what they're hoping to accomplish or this didn't tell me why they want to do this program. I don't understand why they applied for this program. So really be mindful when you're putting it together. It shouldn't be a difficult thing to do. I know that's, that sounds kind of, kind of weird because a lot of people get really um, nervous about this piece, but it shouldn't be difficult because you want to apply for this graduate program. You have reasons for wanting to do that. It, so it, it, should, it should flow easily. I mean, you want to go back and, and proofread but when you first sit down to write it, it should flow pretty easily and just getting your thoughts on paper about why do you want to do this? But it is a really important aspect of the application. So I want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. Um, and if you do have, if there are specific questions, prompts, make sure that you're paying attention to those prompts um, because there's a reason that we ask those specific questions. And if you don't address those questions, the committee is gonna say, why didn't they address these questions in the prompt? Um, so that leads me to say too, you know, 
obviously there's going to be a lot that's the same, regardless of if you're, if you're applying to several programs, there's going to be a lot the same. But we really encourage you to tailor your statement of purpose, not to just write one and submit the same one across the board. You know, it's like when you're applying for a job, you want to tailor your cover letter and your, your resume. The same thing here, you want to tailor that statement of purpose so that that school understands why you want to do our program at our school. And it just does not come across that way if you do a general statement of purpose and just send it out to all those schools. Um, you know, and paying attention to the specific instructions, there, there may be page limits or word limits. Some schools might have a limit, but it doesn't matter. They'll still read it no matter how long it is. Some schools will legitimately stop reading at two pages if, it's at, if it says two pages. So that's where we always encourage you to talk to your admissions team and get that information at fielding. Um, you know, the, the, it, across the programs, we have all of these wonderful admissions advisors here. So don't be shy to reach out and ask us questions. Um, but this is a, a very important and, and to me, fun part of the application. Any of my other wonderful panelists have tips or do's and don'ts about the statement of purpose? You know, I just want to highlight really what you said there. Pay attention to the the prompts that are that are listed there. Um, you know, sometimes we we have questions about um, if the statement of purpose that they that has already been written will will be acceptable. And you know, you you can submit that, but that won't help your your application too much. So definitely pay attention to those prompts that are there for you. Um, they the review committee does ask those questions because that's what they want to they that's what they want to hear about. That is a good point. And you know what? I'll, I'll make one other point before I move on to the next slide. If for any reason you're not admitted to a program when you apply and you go to reapply for the next term or the next year, it is highly recommended that you update your documents and redo a new statement of purpose and talk about what things might have, have changed since the last time you applied and what you may have learned, what you may have accomplished and why you're a stronger candidate this time. So. Again, it is a, a very important part of the application. Derek, I just wanted to add one other thing. Uh, you can actually get into an application. You can get in and out of it as you need until the deadline for the term that you're applying. So you are absolutely welcome to open an application, look at those additional instructions, and then reach out with any questions you might have for your particular program. So just know that you can open it. It won't be timed be sure to take a look and reach back out to us. We're all here to help. That's a very good point. Thank you so much for bringing that up. All right, now letters of recommendation. Not all programs require letters of recommendation. Not all programs at Fielding require letters of recommendation. Uh, actually, it's only our psychology programs that require these at Fielding and the, the ones that our School of Leadership Studies do not. But for the programs that do request letters of recommendation, the reason is they want to get to know you objectively. Uh, we keep talking about getting to know you, but it is a way to get to know you from a more professional space to understand, again, your personal and professional goals. And that's why it's important to prepare your references so that they understand what those are. And it helps us to understand how you're going to fit within the program. This kind of goes back to the, the place, you know, finding the right place and are, is it a good fit? So the things that your references have to say about you help us to see how you would fit in in the classroom, how are you going to interact with your fellow colleagues and your faculty. So it is also a really important aspect of the application if it's being required. Do Ignacio or any of my other panelists want to talk about some of the do's and don'ts? Yeah, I can step in and kind of talk a little bit more about the do's. Great. So you'll want to check in with your references to make sure they'll be able to write a positive letter recommendation for you. Do not assume that they will write a positive one as a negative letter recommendation can lower your chances of admission. And also, if you have a negative letter of uh, recommendation, probably not be not not be a good reference to include for other positions or other roles you want to pursue. But that is definitely something to do is just to ask them directly if they'll have time to do so and send them your most current resume or CV, a list of strengths or anecdotes or achievements you want highlighted in the letter recommendation and formatting tips. Um, if there's a page limit, mention that to them as well. And then you also do not want to submit letter recommendations that are more than a year old from the date of submission. So make sure to check in on your references to ensure that you have received the reference form link to submit their letter recommendation for you. 
Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to an admissions advisor and we'll be happy to assist on that aspect as well. And then another thing just to kind of note, uh, do not ask a family member to write a letter of recommendation. Um, for the most part, you know, we'll assume that family members will shout the world about how amazing you are, but we want to be able to have a reference that can speak to you on your professional and academic experience. So that is one thing to keep in mind as well. Excellent points. Thank you so much for that. Okay, moving on from letters of recommendation. The last piece here that we're going to talk about today in terms of best practices is the writing sample or reflective essay. Um, this is something that several of the programs that Fielding requires, not all of the programs require these. Not all programs out there will require something like this, but they might. Um, so this is this is usually requested as a way, again, to get to know you, but to understand your critical thinking skills, especially if you're entering into doctoral level program, you know, our, our faculty like to say, you, you, you know, you're, we know you're not coming in as a doc, as a, as a PhD, right, or an EDD. Um, that's something that you become through the, through the program. Uh, but we do, it is important to have strong academic writing skills uh, so that you have a baseline and foundation for that. Uh, we do actually have writing support services at Fielding to help you know, strengthen that even more, but it is important to see that you have a strong foundation because uh, there is admittedly a, a lot of writing at the doctoral level. It's also important to help us understand your critical thinking skills um, and how you're able to assess an argument or make an argument. Um, so it is again another important aspect um, but I will at this time turn it over to my other panelists to talk a little bit more about what they know about the about these pieces at Fielding and give some tips. Yeah, I just want to share that again, they might differ per program and they might have a very specific prompt that they want you to address. So be sure to log into the application, read over the specific instructions and contact us with any questions. I also add another thing too, when you are looking to uh, proofread your reflective essay, um, aim to have it reviewed by someone you trust in their writing skills and also proofread your paper a day after finishing it. And also a few days after you did your first proofreading, putting some cognitive and physical distance from the paper will aid in helping you be more critical of the paper afterwards as well. Since trying to proofread after you've just finished writing it can definitely um, have you be attached and therefore being able to have that distance will allow you to be more critical of logical arguments, uh, spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, or anything like that. Um, so that's, that's the thing to keep in mind for all of your uh, papers that you submit, but this one especially. Excellent points. So again, we encourage you to be authentic and really showcase your position on the subject if you're being asked to, to make an argument. Um, don't we, we, with all of these, we, we really don't encourage you to wait until the last minute, you know, try to get started earlier. Uh, it will definitely help to reduce your anxiety. Again, don't reuse old writing samples, um, especially if you were not offered admission in, in one term, you're, you're, you're going to want to, you know, make sure that you make those adjustments. Um, as I mentioned before, when I said transcripts are the one thing you can't change, um, that's something to keep in mind when you're looking to, if you're, if you're reapplying, uh, everything else that, that can change, um, you should look to see how you can strengthen those areas. And the final don't might seem obvious, um, but it, it needs to be said is, is not to complain about the articles. Uh, the articles that are selected are selected for a reason. There are limitations on articles that uh, the schools are allowed to use. Um, so be respectful uh, and, and don't complain about the articles. <laughs> All right, so to summarize, um, the major things committees are, are thinking about and things that you should be thinking about as you prepare your, your ap application is, is this the right program? Is this the right place? And is this the right time? So for those of you who are feeling that you have found the right program, and fielding is the right place, and you're ready to start for fall, I'm going to turn it over to Brian to walk you through the application process. Thank you, Erica. 
Before jumping into the application portal, I want to point out again, um, as Caroline mentioned, that you may log in and out of the application portal as needed all the way up until the application deadline for your program. The prompts, the writing assignments and things like that aren't timed, so you can take a look at the prompt and draft in, a, in, your, in Microsoft Word or your preferred word processor and then upload the documents as PDFs when you're ready. Um, with that also being said, the application portals are generally open well in advance of the application deadline. So for the most part, you can get started on an application whenever you are ready and then log in and out as you make progress through that application to submit when it's completed. Okay, so to get started with the application, you can navigate to nearly any of Fielding's web pages to locate the yellow Apply Now button in the upper right hand corner. So all you have to do to get started is click on that button and then you'll be able to get started with creating an account. So after you click the Apply Now button, you'll see this login screen. And if you haven't created an account before, you'll want to click on the new user button there. If you have created an account, you'll enter in your, your email and password there. And there is that forgot your password link down at the bottom of the page. If you need to reset your password, you can click that link, you'll enter in your email address, and then it'll send you a, a reuse link, which is only good for one click. But once you uh, use that, you can reset your password as well. And this is the page if you're clicking on the apply now button for the first time and you're a new user, this is where you'll be taken to create your account. So very simple, you'll just enter in your information here, your program of interest and the term that you are expecting to apply for. Okay, and once you're logged in, there's a few things I want to point out about this page. When you first log in, you'll be taken to this home page. And from here, you can navigate to your applications. But I want to point out this box at the bottom of the page here. Once you have started an application, you'll have an application checklist down at the bottom there. And you can review that checklist to see um, and to just verify that you've completed various components of the application. Um, as you complete parts of the application, these check boxes will fill so you know that that component is complete. But once you log in, you'll click on the My Applications tab up at the top of the page to get started with creating your application. Okay, and this page will have your all of your app active applications and past applications. So if you have submitted an application before in the past, you may be able to see a previous application there listed. So you'll want to click on your active application, which will be indicated in blue there with that, that um, active word in parentheses. Now, when you start your application, you will need to complete the first three sections of the application in order to populate the entire application. So the first three sections are, are pretty direct in what they're asking for, just some demographic information, contact information, and then the program information that you are applying to. Once you complete those first three sections, the rest of the application will be populated based on those responses. And then you can work through those sections one by one as you complete the application. Now, there are a few things I want to point out here as well. Now, down where you see the supplemental application documents, where that arrow is pointing to, at Fielding, that's where you'll be able to see all of the prompts for your writing assignments. Again, it's really important to follow those prompts. You'll be able to see prompts for your critical thinking writing samples, um, your statement of purpose, CV, all of those supplemental application materials um, that are required for your your, your application. Now again, there are instructions about each of these components within the application portal as well. So um, for example, for transcript instructions, I know there was a question in the chat here, you can find detailed instructions about how to order official transcripts. You generally need to go to the school website that you where you completed your degrees to do that. Um, but there are more instructions about really each of these components as well. So you can, uh, you can really pay attention to all of those, uh, those text boxes that are telling you exactly what to do. We've really tried to make this, this application portal as simplified as possible for you so that you can really just go through it one step at a time and focus in on that step. 
Okay, so when everything is completed, you'll be taken to this application submission page. Now, since you have joined us for our, our open house series, we are waiving application fees for you. So when you do complete the, the previous sections, it will bypass the fee payment page and take you to this application submission page. Now, if you click directly on the fee payment page, it won't look like that fee waiver has been applied yet. Um, so just don't click on that page directly. You can just complete all of the other sections and then save and continue to get to this submission page. You'll just enter in your name, the date, and um, ensure that you've read and understand the information. And then you can check those boxes and click submit your application. Once you submit that application, we'll verify everything for completeness, and then we'll send it off to the review committee. Okay, and I'll pass it over to Caroline, who will talk to you about some of the next steps. Thank you, Brian. Now, we understand that everyone's situation is different and we have very specific questions, which is why we're all here to help. So if you haven't already spoken with an admissions advisor, you're welcome to connect with us by phone or email. If your schedule is full, we completely understand that and we can help coordinate a call ahead of time. In addition to speaking with admissions advisors, our financial aid team is available to speak with even before you decide to apply. You can also connect with them by email, phone, or using their appointment calendar to schedule a time to meet with them. And our next virtual open house series, indicated on the following slide, is dedicated to this topic, funding your education. So join our financial aid and scholarships team and myself next week for a, comp a comprehensive discussion on funding options. Part four is called Excited, Scared, Prepared. If you're feeling either or a combination of those, attend this webinar. We'd love to hear how you're feeling at this stage of your higher education journey, answer any questions to help mitigate any, any concerns you might still have at that point. And then part five, Coming up in a few weeks, um, our program directors, lead faculty, and current students will be part of the panel. There'll be amazing resources for any of the program-specific questions you might still have as we approach the week, uh, the application deadline week. So be sure to join us for that. And you know, while there are many ways to stay engaged with us through these various events, if you have any pressing questions, again, simply email us admissions at fielding.edu or give us a call 805-898-4026. We'll put that in the chat for you all. And with that said, this concludes part two of our virtual open house series. So we're going to end the recording now and open it up for questions.